All right. Um, we are able to offer this programming um, in part due to our uh, members and donors. So if you want to check out any information about that, please check our website, peaknature.org. Um, after the talk, we will send you an evaluation form. So um, if you could fill that out, um, it helps us improve future programs. All right, um, if you have any questions, um, our presenter said he is uh, open to questions. So you can either type them into the chat or, um, and I can relay them or you can ask some questions. All right, our presentation tonight is Wind, Wind and Waves from the Sun presented by Fei Yu Li. He is from the, he's a plasma physicist with the New Mexico Consortium. His work targets novel plasma science and applications like benchtop compact particle accelerators, space science and fusion energy. And um, this is the first time um, he's joining us here at Peak, but we really appreciate him speaking for us today. All right, um, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, Elizabeth, yeah, for giving this opportunity. Um, let me share uh, some work. And um, I, actually, as you said, this is my first time to give this kind of talk. So, yeah, also, I don't know uh, what is the, sp the spectrum of the audience is like. So to be safe, I didn't include any equations. But I, but I do see, sorry. <laughs> but I do see uh, some experts in the audience. So probably I made the wrong choice. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's very it's a, it's it's a good pleasure to um to talk about this, and we are currently are working on a project uh, closely related to um the Sun Earth system, the space plasma, space science. So, um um, I will, I will try to show how our work is related to this kind of uh, big problem, like like the sort of wind. So, and um, so let me start. Yeah. So uh, let me start from wind. <laughs> Yeah, so um, for the nature when people uh, is familiar with that, it's a uh, kind of flow of uh, air particles like ox uh, oxygen, nitrogen, and and they're flowing because uh, the pressure difference. And people like the core um, wind as a seaside, are quite gentle, but sometimes it could get also get gusty, like a hurricane. Um, I guess people still have memory about um, the hurricane Ian two months ago, sweeping across um, the Florida, and now get, I believe another. Hurricane Nico is also uh, active on the east coast. So sometimes these kind of strong winds could have cat uh, catastrophic mm -hmm. uh, consequences. But today I'm not, I'm not going to talk about uh, this natural wind. I'm going to talk about the wind from the sun. So uh, often called solar wind. So when we talk about the sun, the first impression people might think of is the lights that are coming off uh, um, the sun. Indeed, in, inside the sun, there are um, intense fusion reactions that generate uh, in extreme heats and radiations. And uh, these radiations are the visible part uh, that are coming to the Earth and <coughs> illuminating our Earth. So this is the sunshine. And this is a, especially true uh, for us living in New Mexico. <laughs> we got abundant sunshine here. So actually, the light or the radiation from the sun is a only or ultimate source of energy, the powers of almost everything on our Earth. So, and here is a, a picture of, I guess, the morning sunshine. It looks quite warm and peaceful. But the fact is that if you go out uh, above the um, atmosphere of the Earth to the outer space, the situation would become much more violent. So here is the sun far on the far end, and here is Earth, so you can see uh, the outer space is not empty, uh, as you, uh, as someone, uh, as some of us may have imagined. It's actually a field with a flow or string of particles that come off the sun, and at a very high speed, like one million miles per hour, it's equivalent to several hundreds of kilometers per, uh, per second. So, so the so 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 the outer space is filled with this kind of solar wind. It's also kind of flow of charged particles. And uh, this, uh, when I when I saw this image, it, it, it actually that um, reminds me of how lonely our uh, Earth is in the deep space. Yeah. So, so uh, here's some basic uh, specs about the solar wind. So basically, it um, composed of electrons, protons, and alpha particles, basically helium ions, that come off the sun, and um, and the and here is the distribution of the solar wind speed. A different latitude of the sun. So you can see faster 
solar wind approaching about um, seven or eight hundred uh, kilometers per second cl uh, close to the <coughs> polar area of the sun. But, it, but uh, uh, around the equatorial <coughs> area, the, the, sun, the solar wind gets much slower. So uh, typically, every second, the um, solar wind number of particles, uh, solar wind um, particles, part number is about 10 to uh, 33. This is a huge number. And the total mass lost due to the due to solar wind is about 1.5 uh, million tons. But uh, uh, actually, the total mass lost per year is only about 10 to minus 14 solar masses. So it's so although it's big and absolute number, but it's still small compared to the total uh, solar mass. That's why um, the solar the, the sun has existed for 4.6 4. Uh, billion years and um, we don't need to worry about it, the sun would uh, disappear due to the <laughs> solar wind. So uh, the solar wind could be visible in the halo around the sun during an eclipse. So it covers the sun, you could see a blurred, uh, a blurred area that is uh, coming off of the sun. So now it might be interesting to compare the solar wind versus the nature land wind. So as I said, both are flow of particles, but the major difference is that the solar wind contains electrically charged particles, instead the, the, the land wind contains neutral air particles. But the electric charge could play a very big difference as we, as we shall see later. And also the solar wind speed is much faster. It's about one million miles per hour. But the strongest hurricane, for the strongest hurricane on Earth, the, the wind speed is only about 150 miles per hour. So solar wind is about a thousand times faster. So because of that, the solar wind could have major consequences on our Earth, like it could cause disruptions to the man-made satellites orbiting in the outer space. I mean, we know our ship communications rely on GPS, so the the disruption caused to the satellites could also disrupt the ship the ship communications. The some solar wind particles could also penetrate um, the atmosphere of the Earth and hit the power grids, so it has major consequences. So does that mean uh, our Earth cannot survive from the um, solar wind? I guess the answer is obviously no. Um, Yes, sorry. Yeah, our Earth is actually indeed protected by slow and right by our own geomagnetic fields, also called as a magnetic field. So here, the, the blue stripes shows a profile of the magnetic fields shaped by the solar wind coming off of the sun. And uh, because of the magnetic fields, the, uh, so, if you, so, so basically the magnetic fields tend to, tend to regulate the charged particle motion. To tend to guide the uh, solar wind particles away from the from the Earth. So th this is very much like you open an umbrella when when you try to um, protect your from, uh, from, uh, from per, per, protect yourself from getting wet. But this kind of but uh, we know even you use umbrella in a heavy rain day, the protection is not complete. You you might still get get wet when there is a heavy there is a heavy burst of uh, um, rain or the car is running by with high speed. So this is also true for solar wind. That means there is, if there is a strong burst of surge of solar wind during a, a short time, like a coronal mass ejection, the solar wind could strongly disturb the magnetic fields of the, of the Earth. In that case, some uh, solar wind particles could actually penetrate through the protection layer provided by our uh, own magnetic field. So these electrons or particles, uh, charged particles from the solar wind could actually precipitate into the polar areas of our Earth. And when they hit the atmosphere, they could ionize the neutral air particles and causing uh, emission of different colored lights. So this is so-called uh, aurora uh, or northern or southern lights observed in those polar areas. And if you understand now understand the principle of the aurora, you could, you could see that this is a strong evidence of the solar wind. So another evidence of the solar wind is um, the tail of the comet, of, of, of comets. So it was long um, observed that the tail of comets always directed away from the sun, no matter where they are traveling. So this is uh, very similar to the, um, the, the wind sock people put to mirror the direction of the natural wind. And it is because it is because the solar wind that blows the the plasma tail of the comets that are shaping the tail in these in these directions. 
So I guess we have uh, talked a, a bit about the basics of the solar wind. So now uh, let's see um, some history about the discovery of solar wind. So the solar wind was formally or formally termed firstly first termed by um, Ian Parker back in 1950s, and if, actually even before that, some uh, hypothesis already put forward by people that there might be particles coming off the sun. But this is the first time, this was the first time uh, dating back to 1950, uh, 1950s that uh, Ian Parker uh, first uh, uh, mathematically established the, the fact that there could be a steady stream of particles, charged particles coming off the sun. And uh, yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, Parker passed away earlier this year. So the background is the imager that is pointing to the solar wind uh, during an e eclipse. So this is the evidence. Uh, this, is an, uh, the, 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 this is a um, this is a moment that the solar wind can be uh, vividly or visually uh, identified by naked eye. So that, there is actually a funny story behind the, the Parkes paper. So when Parker uh, finished the mass and sent the paper to um, Astrophysics journal. This is quite old uh, journal in the astrophysics, and the astrophysics was operated by the University of Chicago, and Parker was also working in University of Chicago. So in that paper, uh, Parker suggests that if the sun's corona was heated to up a million degrees, and people have already realized that the the, the sun's corona or the outer layer of the sun could be about a million degrees, then Parker concludes that there must be a flow of charged, particle, uh, charged particles expanding away from the surface and uh, eventually accelerated beyond the uh, sound speed. So the journal sent the paper out for review and they quickly got the review from uh, the real comments from two reviewers. Actually one of the reviewers are also a colleague of Parker from a uh, University of Chicago. And the review response was quite scathing that um, the real just think that it makes no sense to think that that could be the sun is losing its atmosphere just because like um, the earth is not losing its atmosphere. So then comes this Brahmanian uh, Chandrasekha who was the editor of the Astrophysics Journal. Chandrasekha was also part of his colleague at the University of Chicago. So you can see that the whole story was really about or really labeled with uh, the University of Chicago brand. So the editor later, uh, by the way, the Chandrasekhar later uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, in 1983. By that time, when Chandrasekhar got the review comments that he he looked into that paper, he did not like the idea of particle either. But he but the fact that he could not find any flaws with particle mass, so he insightfully overruled the review comments and published the the paper. So when I, when I first read this story, I learned a few lessons like the power of mass. So sometimes when the mass is when the mass shows that fact and the mass derivation is correct, probably it's true. A second is that science is often counterintuitive. And for uh, those who work in um, who work in the academia, it, the fact is that the referee system does not does not always work. So the important is that uh, just a, a year later, the solar wind was actually directly observed by a Soviet spacecraft, the Luna One. And three years later, a similar observation was made by a NASA space, uh, spacecraft called uh, Maria 2 on its journey to Venus. So in honor of uh, the significant uh, discovery or prediction by um, in Parker, and in, um, recently, just uh, four years ago, and it's actually 60 years after the publication of that original paper, uh, NASA launched a, a, a probe called uh, Parker Solar Probe to um, detect or investigate the solar, the solar wind. So actually this is the first NASA script card named after a living person. So this is the um, solar probe image the, uh, on the background um, with the sun as the background. And here is the, the, the Magellan curves show the actual tra uh, trajectories of the uh, PSP or Parker Solar Pro uh, Probe. So you know everything in the solar system is orbiting around the sun. So the, the Park Solar Probe is not approaching the sun constantly. Instead, it, do, it, it does this kind of circles and uh, approaches the sun gradually uh, after each cycle. So the unique feature of the Park Solar Probe is that it can approach within about 10 degree, a uh, 10 solar, solar radii. 
And this is the closest ever artificial object to the sun. Imagine that the sun Earth's distance is about 213 solar radii. So it's really close to the sun. So because of that, NASA uh, we de um, describes that as uh, touching the sun. So with the history and um, some basics, uh, we, we, might, we might ask uh, what actually determines the solar wind behavior or solar wind dynamics. It's actually essentially it's governed by the plasma. So for people who are not familiar with plasma, plasma is a state of matter. It's not commonly found in our um, daily life on Earth, but it actually accounts for more than 99% of the observable universe. Of course, currently we are also talking about dark, uh, energy dark matter, so that are excluded from that. So plasma, as I said, plasma is a state of matter. And usually we know there is a solid state, a liquid state, and a gas state. The plasma is often termed the, for, the, the fourth state. So imagine you have a, a, a cube of ice and you heat it, it starts to melt and become liquid water. And you hit it further, it becomes a stream of gas. But can we hurt it, hit, hit it further again? So as we know, the, the gas is, is made of atoms. The so atoms is further made of uh, uh, nucleus and uh, electrons orbiting. And according to quantum uh, mechanics, these electrons has, have certain energy levels. And this corresponds to the bound energy. So if you hit it further, uh, this electron could actually be stripped from um, the nucleus. So electrons have uh, a negative charge and nucleus have positive charge. So if you hit it, hit it um, enough, those electrons can be stripped off and creating a state that um, the matter is composed of ionized nucleus and uh, or ions and uh, uh, negatively charged electrons, and this is the state of plasma. And it can be it can be found in stars, electric arcs, lightning, or neon light signs on our streets. So in order to hit the like a hydro, like the hydrogen atoms in the plasma, you probably need about uh, 0 0.1 million uh, degrees. So if you remember this number, then we could conclude, well, then we could uh, conclude that the sun is a giant plasma ball. That's because if you uh, cut through the sun, at the very heart of the sun, it's the nuclear fusion factory. And I said this nuclear fusion creates extreme heat and the heat then the core could be heated up to 27 million degree. And if you go out, go into the radiative zone, it cools a little bit down to about 20 million, uh, 12 million degree. Even out, even out into the convective zone, it's about four million. So still very hot. So all the matter in the are in the state of plasma. And it goes even further out, you matter the photosphere and a chrom chromosphere. So they are cool about um, uh, 10K degree. So the photosphere is actually the innermost layer that we, we could see um, with our eyes. But it's very surprising that if you go further beyond surface, there is a large area extending a thousands of miles above the photosphere. It's called the coronal region, this broad area. And this is the source area of the solar wind. And despite the photosphere and, a, and the chromosphere is, is, is relatively cold, the, the coronal area is actually can be heated, uh, can be actually heated up to several million degree. And if, and if you remember that you just need about the one tenth million degree to heat the hydrogen into plasma, the several million degrees is hot enough to um, analyze the matter in this area into plasma. And it's enough to eject uh, the solar wind. So once the solar wind is ejected, uh, they are essentially plasmas, right? The, the plasma they are ejected from the sun, they also drags out, they also drag out the uh, solar magnetic field, like showing about these curved, um, th these curved lines. So as I said, this magnetic field tend to regulate the particle motion. So basically all charged particles tend to gyrate around the magnetic field line. And so in this uh, large scale, the plasma and the magnetic field are kind of frozen together and they're bounded together. So in order to answer uh, what, actually, what, what actually determines the solar wind behavior, it might be important to first answer what determines the plasma behavior because solar wind is essentially made of plasma. So as I said, a plasma is essentially a box of uh, ionized matter. 
consisting of um, um, positively charged ions and negatively charged uh, electrons. And you know, uh, charged particles tend to interact with each other, like um, same sign charges tend to repel each other and then opt uh, opposite sign charges tend to attract each other. And the mutual interactions essentially define the plasma behavior. And because the electric charge, it's the electric force and the magnetic forces and the electric, uh, the electric current that define the dynamics. And they, and they could be um, fully or well de or described by the Maxwell equation. The Maxwell equations are named after James Clerk Maxwell, a Scottish physicist in the 19th century. So by the way, uh, the APS has the um, Maxwell Prize and, the, and this prize is uh, regarded as the highest honor in the plasma physics. So because of the, of the mutual interaction between the different sign of uh, uh, charged particles, and because also because of the large number of particles involved in the system. So, uh, so arguably uh, the plasma dynamics is the most complex dynamics in the modern classical physics. But uh, if you just look at individual particles, it could be a mass and it could be very difficult to answer any questions about uh, the, plasma, the plasma behavior. So uh, another level to see the problem is about is using waves. So what is wave? So wave is a, a dynamic disturbance. And a, another feature is that it's also propagating. So like uh, um, in, the, in the neutral particle system, like in the water, water particles. So if you throw a stone into the water, it will create a disturbance, the propagating outward. This is a water wave. At the seaside and in the sea, if there is a strong hurricane, it could also drive strong ocean waves, like shown here. Tens meters high. So in plasma, similar uh, similar things could happen, and it, and in fact, the plasma is an excellent platform for supporting all kinds of different waves. So I uh, just uh, put two examples here. Like throwing an, a stone into water, you can also throw a something into plasma, but in order to disturb the plasma, because the plasma are essentially electrically charged, so you need uh, something that also containing electric or magnetic fields. So one example is a, is a laser. Laser is essentially an electromagnetic wave. So when you send a laser into the plasma, it could drive in plasma waves, like these, part, like these electrons could be displaced, displaced by the laser, creating some uh, plasma waves behind the laser. And this kind, of, this kind of perturbation is quite localized. And the localized or the individual particle effects could be, uh, could be also important in some cases, like here, some electrons could be driven away from the center region. So another picture of the plasma wave is kind of global, a large scale behavior. It's behave like a, a fluid. So here you can imagine these lines representing um, the magnetic fields, which is also present in the solar system. So these, uh, like part, uh, these dots are the uh, charged particles, like uh, for example, the blue dots are um, the ions and the red dots are the electrons. So you can see that they could be put as a, put as a global scale and they could uh, create wave or disturbances propagating um, at a, a larger scale. So for the solar wind dynamics, we're more interested in, the, uh, in this uh, later type, the flow type scale. So the right language to describe that is uh, called uh, a magnetohydrodynamics or simply MHD. So, um, so this is a long word. So basically, it mean, so be, basically it means that collectively the plasma behaves as a hydrodynamics or fluid dynamics. That's the, a little half part of the word means. But also because solar wind is, a, is a immersed into, in the solar, uh, solar magnetic field, so it also strongly magnetized. So because of these two facts, MHD is also sometimes called uh, magnetofluid dynamics or hydromagnetics. But I, I, yeah, personally, I don't like uh, either of them. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah but anyway, it's, um, this name was first used by uh, Heinz Arven in, uh, back in 1940s. So Heinz, Heinz Arven is uh, another important figure in development of uh, the plasma physics, especially those are responsible for the solar wind dynamics. So especially 
uh, took the original sentence from that paper when Hans Arfen first uh, used the magnetohydrodynamics. hydrodynamics. He said, at, at last some remarks are made about the transfer of momentum from the sun to the planets, which is fundamental to the theory. The importance of the magnetohydrodynamic waves in this re respect is pointed out. So why I emphasize so much about the uh, magnetohydrodynamics hydrodynamics, because this is a Nobel Prize winning terminology. So this is Hans Arfen. He's a, he was a um, Swedish plasma uh, physicist, and he got the uh, 1970s Nobel Prize in physics for his work on MHD or magneto hydrodynamics. And by the way, it's um, uh, what's why I mentioned is that uh, this is the only Nobel Prize um, won by uh, uh, area of plasma physics. So um, Arfen made a lot of uh, uh, original contributions to the uh, Sun Earth's um, plasma system. Like uh, he proposed a theory of magnetic storms, is kind of some that could strongly disturb the magnetic fields of our magnetic field. And like the theory of auroras and the theory of plasma dynamics in Earth's magnetic sphere. But importantly, which is uh, so uh, relevant to the solar winds that in 1942, in the Nature paper, he proposed the theory of Arfon waves, which is the most fundamental uh, MHD wave. And um, it's fundamental because, also because that, uh, the waves are ubiquitously found in the solar wind. So you might also say, see that the solar wind dynamics are so closely related to the Arfon waves. So what is Arfon waves? is basically a transverse wave. By transverse, I mean that the wave um, perturbation is transverse to the background magnetic field. So here is the solo, solo magnetic field. And it's also, of course, it's a disturbance that traveling, but traveling would be, a bond, would be regulated by the background magnetic field. Essentially, it tends to be uh, along the magnetic field line. So here it shows like uh, this is the sun's surface and the, um, there could be um, different types of magnetic uh, field of the sun, like this closed um, geometry, and this is open magnetic field geometry. So R from waves basically uh, means the perturbation of the magnetic field plus the bounded uh, uh, plasma medium. So you can see here is in the upward propagating R from wave. And um, this is actually much um, uh, similar to that if you hold a rope and a tie that another end to the wall. And if you, if you start to uh, take one end, uh, you can see uh, the rope starts to oscillate transversely and the oscillation could also propagate uh, towards the wall. So you can here, you can imagine the rope um, like the magnetic field or the plasma. So as I said, r waves are ubiquitous found in space measurement, like by the Parker probe. So basically the space part, uh, the space uh, craft would measure some properties of the solar wind, like the magnetic field at different um, um, components along different directions, and also associated the plasma um, velocities along different directions. So if you align the data together, like the right, uh, the, the left axis shows the magnetic field, the right axis shows um, the velocity field, and you can see each component, for each component, the magnetic field and the velocity fields are strongly correlated. Actually, they are matched very well. And these observations are usually obtained for a period of um, a day or even several days. So, our, so from this, we can see that the alpha wave contains both plasma motion energy and the magnetic field energy. And the two are well correlated. So these are the fundamental feature of the alpha wave. So because of that, the alpha wave, because, because I said the alpha wave could transport along the magnetic field. So, also because the alpha, alpha wave contains the plasma motion energy. So it's a perfect, so alpha wave could be a, a perfect energy uh, carrier, but this is only true for small amplitude. So here, uh, this is a simulation I made um, simply to describe uh, the transport of the energy by the alpha wave. The top panel, the blue uh, lines, the blue color shows the forward of um, a packet that is about to go forward. And you ought to see uh, whether there's any dissipation of the alpha wave. I also draw the uh, bellward alpha wave. The bottom line, the, the bottom panel shows associated plasma density fluctuation. So for this small amplitude, a kick off the simulation, you can see that um, 
the packet is just uh, transport from the left side to the right side with a negligible bellwood R from wave. And the packet remains in a good shape, intact, and there's no other kind of um, dissipation. So that means the energy is efficiently transported from one end to another end along the background uh, manifold line. So this is a, a demonstration that the iPhone wave is a perfect energy carrier. But the, but the issue is that uh, this small amplitude iPhone wave behavior cannot explain how slow wind got heated up along the way. As you remember that the slow wind would be accelerated eventually up to a uh, um, ultrasonic speed. So how slow wind got heated up or got accelerated? This is a mystery. So, but it could happen that if you, you could transfer that because the energy is carried is carried by alpha wave. So it's possible that the slow wind get um, gets heated up if you transfer part of the energy from the alpha wave to the plasma. But in all that, but in order for that to happen, nonlinear wave wave or wave uh, plasma particle interaction are key here. So mild wave coupling can actually tra help transfer energy from one wave to another. Yeah, unfortunately, this is the virtual format I cannot uh, demonstrate this, but this is, but, it, but I actually I could draw a, a mechanical an analogy here. So yeah, we could uh, consider um, like uh, we could consider two oscillators or two springs attached to a bar. The, hor the horizontal bar is uh, rests on the pivot. And the pivot could be uh, driven by a wheel or wheels and um, and the pivot could uh, um, move uh, um, back and forth. So basically um, put up in the bar. So basically there are a th three wave system. One, the two are the two oscillators and then the, the third one is uh, this pivot motion. So typically um, if the pivot is that steer, the wave energy coupling from the the second oscillator, the first oscillator is very weak. But if you move the pivot at a certain um, certain frequency, like by turning the wheels, that is possible that the wave energy can be efficiently coupled from one end to another. Yeah, I, I, I hope this uh, mechanical uh, operators can be demonstrated, yeah. But, 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 but essentially I want to see that a model wave coupling is an essential component here they can transfer energy from one wave, one, wave, one wave to another. So for, for our case, we want the energy can be transferred from the iPhone wave to other types of waves or to the plasma. But as, as I um, said, the plasma could support various kinds of waves. So some of which can be coupled to a large amplitude solar wind iPhone wave. So here shows a case of nonlinear iPhone wave interactions. So by nonlinear, here basically means that the wave amplitude is high enough that um, the other waves can participate in the wave coupling. So basically I just raised the amplitude of the previous example. So now the similar thing, this is the forward going out from wave. And if we kick off the simulation, you can see the back portion of the alpha wave can be dissipated quickly and forming backward alpha wave and a strong coupling to the plasma density fluctuations. And as coupling to the plasma density fluctuation is a good sign that the plasma could be, heat, could be heated up. That means the energy is transferred from the pump iPhone wave to the plasma. So the nonlinear iPhone wave interaction is a good example that the, iPhone, the, the solar wind can be, heated, uh, can be accelerated. So speaking of the methods to study solar wind, of course, the, the spacecraft measurement is uh, is a, is a good one, but the, like the like the Paxlo Pro, but you know this kind of um, this, this kind of measurement is quite expensive. You need to launch that device into deep space, and also you know the space is uh, is very vast, so the sampling provided by the few spacecraft could be quite quite limited, and also the plasma condition basically we have no control about the, the plasma condition to be studied, but of course the spacecraft could provide in situ measurement. It's very useful. And uh, recently with the advancement of the high power, high performance computing, we could also do simulations, uh, especially like uh, this kind of global simulation that we can uh, simulate uh, from the solar base to far beyond. Another way is to uh, use laboratory 
uh, magnetized plasma experiments. So essentially, solar wind is about magnet magnetized plasma. So why not we uh, create a similar uh, plasma and uh, put it into some background and magnetic field to perform controlled study? So the 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 major benefits of this kind of uh, uh, activity is that we can well control the plasma and the wave conditions used to study this process. So that th this can be quite useful to clarify some basic um, plasma process with relevance to the solar wind. So in the US, a whole network is forming to study the magnetized plasma dynamics in the laboratory. So here I show a number of uh, um, labs scattered around uh, the country. Um, so yeah, the, so the fascinating part of the, is this, uh, this, this devices could be very different in geometry, in size, in the plasma conditions, and they are used to study all uh, different kinds of uh, uh, plasma phenomena, including those with relevance to the solar wind. So of most relevance to our project is um, a device at the basic plasma science facility at UCLA. The primary uh, device is the large plasma device is shown here. The device is about 20 meters long. And uh, so it's really big. I guess that's why there is no better uh, um, na naming than just simply call it a large plasma device. So the idea is that, um, so basically the, the basic configuration of the device is that there are uh, well aligned uh, electromagnets that produce a background magnetic field along the length of the device. So it might be complicated uh, from, uh, to see from the um, up panel, but in the, bo but in the bo bottom panel, I will draw a sketch or device. So what do you have in the one end is um, a cathode anode discharge. So th th this can be used to create an electron beam. And then the major body is filled with a neutral gas. And once the discharge happens, the electron beam would be sent into the neutral gas to ionize and forming a plasma. And during the plasma discharge, the RF waves could also be launched using an antenna. So actually you could insert antenna. This is the real picture of the, of the antenna. So it's about two loops. You could um, create a different uh, polarization of the wave. So the antenna is actually is about just a ten, uh, of diameter about a 10 centimeter. So here just, um, yeah, actually a year ago, we had a chance to join an experiment uh, at a, a LPD. So here are some uh, uh, more pictures about the device. This is the um, panel used to monitor the plasma conditions, uh, the discharge conditions. And um, so, yeah, hopefully you can see this video showing how device is operating. It's quite noisy over there. And this is from the side of view. And uh, so you can see the flash inside the device and, it, and each flash actually refers to a plasma discharge. So the, the device is essentially operating at um, one second uh, um, per shot. So it's uh, one Hertz. So what we have been doing is that uh, we, we do the experiment on one hand, but also try to develop a, numer a, a numerical simulation tool to study the large plasma device R from waves under very similar conditions. So I just uh, show some pictures of our uh, simulation results. So I'm not going to explain details, but just basically shows this from full 3D simulation and uh, shows how we can inject a, a full 3D R from wave very close to the LPD R from wave launched from an antenna. And it shows how the currents are associated with R from wave. And if nonlinear uh, interactions happen, how could dense fluctuation can be generated? how the plasma can um, be heated up in the parallel direction. So this uh, might be related to how we understand uh, the solar wind uh, is, uh, um, is got heated up. So finally, I want to show an example um, how the alpha wave decay was simulated using our tool. So as I said, I will, our goal is try to um, simulate the LPD alpha wave 
using conditions as close as possible. So in the LPD, we have the cathode to produce a plasma. We have antenna to inject a wave. We have probes to uh, diagnose the plasma process. So here we also, we also inject the r wave uh, in the middle of the plasma, similar to LPD. So we show one case how the wave interacts with the plasma. The wave was launched probably to both sides and you can to see this jiggling of the wave profile. The jiggling means that the wave is strongly interacting with the um, plasma. So here actually you can see this regular density fluctuations caused by the wave interaction. And it's, uh, it's an indication that the strong uh, nonlinear interaction indeed happened. So in the simulation, we could also provide detailed diagnostics of what's going on during um, the interaction. Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have more scientific results to show, but I guess I can stop here. I guess the key idea is that um, I hope the audience get a sense um, how approach, how we approach uh, big problems um, uh, like uh, um, um, the slow one step by step and how we can uh, do some uh, basic element of study using laboratory study and using computer simulations. So finally, some uh, takeaway uh, take message. The first is that like the zero wind, the solar wind is a flow of particles, but difference that is electric charged. And um, the slow wind could have a huge impact on our Earth as space weather. So second is that it, a solar wind was formally discovered only decades ago. It's actually shorter than we had expected. And now it's been closely monitored and directly explore, explored using spacecraft like the Parkesolo probe. And uh, I also try to um, try to uh, emphasize the slow wind behavior essentially governed by the plasma and associated wave dynamics, especially the r phone wave. It's so ubiquitous found in, 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 in the slow wind. So finally, in, the, in, in addition to the direct spacecraft measurement, laboratory study and associated computing modeling have, becoming, uh, have become increasingly important. And, so, and, that, and that's where our work falls in. So yeah, thank you uh, everyone for showing up and on this special night. Yeah, I'd like to take a question to my half. Thank you. Well, it's a good time. All right, thank you. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, feel free um, to unmute and ask your questions or to put them in the chat and we can follow them there. Um, thank you for the talk. I enjoy that the best name they could come up for um, the device was large, <laughs> the large <laughs> device, <laughs> so. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Um, Feiyu, hi, this is Galen Gissler. Um, I was hi. wondering if you could um, say something about the uh, um, relationship of the, the, the solar wind speed to the 11-year um, or 22-year solar cycle of sunspots. Um, the relationship is solar wind speed. Um, oh, this is a very <laughs> professional question. Yeah, I didn't expect you. Um, yeah, the, I, 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 guess, I guess I don't have an answer. Also to that, sorry. Yeah, so I, I, I didn't study into the, the 20 or, or the cycle of that uh, sunspots. Yeah, so I'm not sure if the audience or any of the, anybody from the audience could have with this. Oh, God, this is rough recollection. I should know this, but I don't. But as far as I remember, you do get variations of the flow speed over the solar cycle. And I, yeah, I would you should... say that. During solar maximum, you get more fast solar wind, even at lower latitudes. But I know a bunch of other names here in the participant list. If anybody of those wants to correct me, please go ahead. Yeah, I see. Yeah, quite a few experts here. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, sorry, I, I really didn't look, look into this. Yeah, <laughs> I cannot draw an immediate connection between the two. Yeah, I was waiting for Joe Borowski to <laughs> jump up and answer the question. Yeah, it's a very hard uh, question. Yeah, uh, yeah he would know from the top of the, his head. But one thing that's uh, for sure is that during solar maximum, the distinction between fast solar uh, wind and slow solar wind is not as nice. It gets a lot more patchy and it switches back and forth in speed a lot more. All right. Um, well, that was good discussion. Uh, <laughs> uh, do we? Are there any other questions out there we can try to discuss? 
Well, from uh, my yeah. point of view, I'm a I'm an educator at Peak, and so I enjoyed the historical context you gave. Um, so that is useful for me for using for students and things like that. So I like I like that even the guy who invented it um, didn't uh, didn't originally get his paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good lesson for students. Yeah. Also, I want to uh, advertise for Fei Yu. Uh, I mean, if you know, I know there are experts in in audience so if you guys are interested in any type of collaboration you know Fei is very good at uh, kinetic simulations so he developed tools to simulate this uh, laboratory experiment and then we hope to apply what we've learned in the laboratory to to the real space so if you guys have any ideas or you know uh, the proposal mm -hmm. ideas or paper ideas where you're very welcome to contact us uh, maybe we can collaborate and you know write papers and right write proposals together right exactly yeah I, and i didn't expect a, a, a lot of experts show up today otherwise i would have some more fancy stuff in the slides <laughs> well last call for questions um uh last chance to think of them i will mention that next week um for peak we are having um another uh live stream talk it will be on the mysteries of betelgeuse by heidi morris from the pajarito astronomers um and so it'll be at seven o'clock on friday as well um also the pajarito astronomers next week um on um Saturday the 19th, I believe, they're having their last dark night of the year at Overlook Park. And so um, that's where you can go and people bring their telescopes and you get to um, do some practical astronomy. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, um, I will thank our speaker once again. Um, thank you. And um, thanks everyone to, um, to coming tonight. Thank you. Yeah, have a good night. All right, thanks. Sorry that we can't. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. <clears throat> bye.